Welcome to the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast with your host, Ahmed Abdul Kader and Jaden Garcia. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast with Ahmed and Eric. Before we dive in, I do want to briefly apologize for the lack of an episode last week. Our team was spread fairly thin between med school for me, residency for Jaden and Eric, and so. <laughs> Uh, life kind of happened that week, but that's okay. We're back and we'll be back for the foreseeable future. Um, uh, on that note, Jaden, life of a resident, we haven't seen you in a couple weeks. Yeah. What, what's going on? Yeah, man. I, uh, I had a much needed vacation, uh, not too long ago. I think you kind of hold tight to those opportunities. You're not working in the hospital. Right. I have, I had a, awesome time seeing my nephew in a couple states away nice and uh oh yeah i've been back at the grind and and having a good time we're about to kind of turn over services so i'll be on a new service back to the pediatric hospital again so cool cool yeah things are good man how are you oh go ahead sorry was there i was just gonna ask (laughs) is the pediatric hospital would you say it's lower stress or higher stress than working with the general population um i I think in general, our team structure is a little less robust as far as how many people we have. So it makes for a busier time given okay. the load that we have to accommodate as patient load that is. Um, and we just, just have less people to kind of help out on that side. It's super rewarding though. Like you get a lot of opportunity to impact the lives of kids. Right. And their their parents and, and other family members. And so it's it's a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed working with kiddos. Nice and cool. Sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt your question there. No, no. I'm just so eager to hear what the life of a new medical student has been like for you, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm drowning in different hospital <laughs> ID cards. Um one of the uh one of the hospitals. I never will understand this. I'm sure there's a good reason, but there's an ID card, and then there's like a, a plain white security card. That's the one that you scan to get into different places. Yeah. We have a separate ID card, whereas another hospital, the ID card is the security mm. card. I was just like, why don't we, why don't we put them? Like, that's a very minor thing, but it's just like, it's getting to the point where like my lanyard can't accommodate more cards. Mm. Yeah. And so removing this like quarter inch bland piece of piece of plastic would have been nice but um from a workload standpoint it's been fine um you know still kind of feeling out you know what my mode of studying will be yeah um i've gotten back into anki again which i happened i didn't use anki at all in my undergrad like not once yeah Mm -hmm. Uh, i used it for the mcat but Mm -hmm. like the thought of like making my own Anki cards for an undergrad exam, like never crossed my mind. <laughs> and then um, I realized that, and this is going to maybe hint at my frugality as a medical student, but um, I realized that there's a web version of Anki for Apple users that doesn't require you to buy the $35 app. And so once I found that out, I was like, oh, I can do this. Like, you know, while like dinner's cooking or while, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm on a train or whatever, I was like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. I can study on my phone. I'm on my yeah. phone more than I care to admit anyway. So I might as well yeah. be productive there. Uh, so I've been making my own cards. It's been good. Got my first exam next Monday. So um, that'll be uh, that'll be an updatable topic. I think yeah. we'll see. Uh, we'll see how life as a medical student is going then. Um, but it should be okay. Like, I'm not too worried. Um, the only thing that's like mildly concerning is that it, it's pass fail, but the pass is like a 77. So mm. fairly high for a pass fail metric, but, um, all the sort of upper year medical students have been saying, you're definitely going to overstudy for the first one, which is reassuring. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. But so far, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying being new. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm loving living in a big city. It's a lot of fun. Like I was uh, a little bit timid about it at first. But now yeah. it's just like everything is a five-minute walk away. 
and uh, I'm I'm having a blast. It's nice when you're in a big city going to medical school, and you, because when you do find you know a few seconds for yourself, there's a host of things surrounding you that you yeah. can quickly get to. Exactly, and like all the hospitals are like at least many of the major hospitals are less than a five minute walk from our like our medical building yeah um it's it's interesting like my medical school the university of toronto isn't like a lot of the american schools where like we have or even other canadian schools where like we have like the university of toronto hospital yeah but we have what's called uhn or the university health network which is i guess a larger series of hospitals uh it's not like directly under the university of toronto name Mm -hmm. but there's like in a you know 200 yard radius there's a cancer center there's a hospital for sick children there's two major um two major hospitals there's a rehabilitation institute and there is a mental health hospital yeah all just like kind of within that diameter which is really cool because you know, we haven't gotten to this point yet, but when you start looking for shadowing opportunities, like everybody's just like right there, like you'll be grabbing your coffee and a physician will be in front of you. And, um, yeah, no, it's, it's been great. And then I'm, I'm fortunate, like where I live in the city is kind of further from like further into downtown away from the hospitals, which is cool because, you know, I, I bike to school, so it's not Mm -hmm. a long commute by any means, but like I'm getting the academic you know, side here and I'm getting like the downtown life here. Um, so it, it's a nice balance, like where like I can come home and like, I feel like I've left school. Like there's that yeah. physical and mental like separation. Uh, and that's been really healthy for me actually. Uh, whereas I feel like if I could like look out of my window and see like the hospital right in front of me, mm-hmm. it's like you, you never really like clock out if that makes sense. Right. Uh, but my, like, I'm looking at Lake Ontario for my room. So it's been nice. That's awesome. Yeah. It's been good. <laughs> well, but. I'm super stoked for you, man. This is exciting, I think, for everybody to hear kind of pre med, Ahmed to MS1. Yeah. Or I'm not sure if the, the lingo is the same in Canada, but Thanks, first uh. med student just yeah. crushing it. Um, you had mentioned, you know, the Anki business and having to kind of translate your previous experience to med school now. And I think, you know, the topic today for our listeners that we can start to transition a little bit is uh, similar in the sense that when you're a pre-med, you're going to have to use question banks without a doubt to to do well, which is why we're all here. But that's not a practice that just goes away once the MCAT's taken. I mean, yeah. there's so many more standardized exams ahead of us. And and yeah. make the question banks may change, but the principles of how to utilize them, how to get the most out of them, you know, kind of stay the same over time. And so that's kind of our topic for today is how we can maximize our question bank usage and get the most out of it if we're going to spend the time to to go through it. So. I'll right. kind of toss out a question, Ahmed, right out the gate. Kind of what was your experience preparing for the MCAT when it came to question banks? Yeah. I mean, I was, uh, I've always been a big practice question person. Yeah. But <clears throat> with the MCAT, you know, the, the challenge that I faced was I also just like hate getting things wrong. Like <laughs> many of us, but like, The reason I bring that up is because I was hesitant to get into question packs until I felt like, okay, I can, in theory, answer everything. Like, I've covered everything. Mm -hmm. Now, if I get something wrong, it's just because I forgot or I didn't understand. Not that I didn't learn it yet. But, you know, that was with respect to passages. Like, I wanted, you know, when I sat down to do passages, I wanted strategy to be the limitation, not content. Yeah. Um, and so there's actually a lot of good in that, like that I preach to my students now. Like I'm really big on like lots of discrete questions early on. Yeah. Like I think like if we take like a typical four month study timeline for the MCAT, like 
the first like six to eight weeks is really just taking the seesaw from like 90% discrete, 10% passages to like doing this. Mm -hmm. And then you get into practice exams. And so like my, what I did was effectively that, like I did discrete questions, albeit like, almost exclusively for like the first six weeks of my prep, which in hindsight, I would have, you know, sprinkled in some passages uh, a little bit earlier, but heavy dose of discrete questions for me early on. And then I got into, you know, more passage practice with discrete as needed. When I say as needed, I mean, you know, I, I get a question wrong in a passage that's more of a content gap than it is mm -hmm. a strategy issue. I would then review that content and then reinforce it with discrete questions, like specifically targeting it. Um, there was something else I was going to say. I lost my train of thought, but uh, it'll come back to me, I hope. But yeah, I think that was the general gist for me, like the discrete questions early. Oh, yes. Um, what I mentioned, um, you know, I wish I would have thrown in passage practice earlier. Yeah. I think, um, you know, with a you know, well publicized question bank, whether it's the AMC or Jack Weston, um, you can learn that certain passages are targeting specific topics. And if you have that foresight, you can introduce passage practice without content being a limitation. And so there was a middle ground there that I actually didn't explore we'll say but i think you know if i were to do it again that would be my process so, you know heavy discretes early shift in favor of passages mm -hmm. and as i cover more content there will be more passages that are quote unquote fair game right yeah. but just early on you need to know or it would be very helpful to know okay these are good sources of passages for topics abc right, right. and i think that makes the mcat very unique because I think a lot of students are so indoctrinated in how standardized questions should look like from their experience with the ACT, the SAT, or any other right. test up until this point. And I'm not sure that there's been so much of a dramatic change in how the questions look and how their things are phrased or asked than my transition as a pre-medical student trying to take the MCAT. Mm -hmm. You know, once I got to med school and started to take step one, step two, step three, the transition from MCAT to that was super easy. I think the transition from like your ACT, SAT, general chemistry class to the MCAT is one of the most steep learning curves. Yeah. And I couldn't overemphasize what you were saying trying to get that a sense of that early on is super super helpful and so that's like a teaching point right off the bat is the students that we've worked with over the years you know we've seen a lot of students make the mistakes of trying to just hold back hold back hold back until they feel like right. they're so proficient in the content and that, that's a mistake. You have to start understanding how these questions are asked in a different format and way than you're traditionally used to thinking. 100%. And that is really hard to make that transition in a matter of a couple of weeks, you know, which and I've it's, seen people try and do. It's funny you mentioned the uh, the, the transitions there, Jaden. I saw something, mm -hmm. or I didn't see it. A friend of mine saw it. Uh, the other day, I uh, shared it with me just because he knows of my interest in potentially going back to the U.S. for, for residency. Yeah. And um, it was basically this, uh, I think it was a resident, but I can't remember, uh, basically uh, highlighting those, you know, transitions from different <laughs> exams to exams. And he said, you know, three months for the MCAT, three weeks for step one, three <laughs> days for step two, and a number three pencil for step three. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> and uh, I was like, listen, I, I don't know about the step one through three part, but yeah. the MCAT part looks okay. You know, that we'll see how the rest of the 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 quote pans out. But um, yeah. I think, you know, that's to your point that like the MCAT of all those exams yeah. required the most time because mm -hmm. it is the steepest learning curve. And I think you'll find 
when it comes to the MCAT that makes that unique is there is a huge variety of time that students have to dedicate to this test where right. the moment you become a medical student where you're at right now and beyond, we're all kind of on the same timeline and we kind of all have the same amount of time. It does vary a little bit. Yeah. Um, based, you know, if you're involved in research or you're, you're have a family or you have a, have to travel to see a significant other, like all of those things play a role, but basically like you and all your classmates from here on out have similar time opportunity. Whereas yeah. like in this MCAT world, you're trying to get to medical school and you have some people who work full-time jobs and have very little time and are trying to crush it into, you know, just their four years of undergrad. And then others will take gap years and others, you know, may, you know, it's just so variable. And right. that's a scary thing because you're trying to be better than people, essentially. I, I mean, it's kind of taboo to talk about, but yeah. in order to get there, you kind of have to do well on a test that's standardized and and i, mean, I think ultimately 100 percent. like the unfortunate nature of it is like you getting in means somebody else did exactly right? and you know it's you don't want to frame it that way like right. you don't want to feel bad for getting into medical school right, right. obviously not like, you earn mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you know you you've got to feel you know the reward of that um and you know i've been a very like outspoken critic against like the the stereotypical pre med culture. Like mm -hmm. I just I I hate it with almost every ounce of my being. Um, just because like it's think about it, right? Like we're trying to breed people who are supposed to learn to care for other people. Yeah, but all they care about is surpassing with buffer room other people. Right. Right. Like we're, or, and, you know, it is a double edged sword because, like, on one hand, you want the cream of the crop. But on the other hand, you're basically saying you need to be the cream of the crop, which means, you know, you can't be the cream of the crop if everybody's the cream of the crop. You know what I mean? Right. And so, like, we're, we're in a scenario where we want to select for the best. But in doing that, you're training people to put themselves here and others there. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas a physician's kind of got to do this. And so I like, I had a, there was a particular club, ironically enough, it was literally called the pre med club <laughs> at my undergrad. And it was, you know, some of them were, were great, but a lot of them were just these, you know, we'll say you're stereotypical pre med students. And I, I was telling my roommate the other day, like, that's why I love the fact that I was a varsity athlete in my undergrad because my friend group was like 5% pre-med, 95% athlete. Yeah. And like in that bubble, like there weren't a lot of pre-med varsity athletes. Like that was a very, very niche group. And so I never felt that we'll say cutthroat competition type of vibe. Mm -hmm. It's because like, I, was, <laughs> I feel bad saying it, but I was, I was surrounded by football players all the time and, you know, right. not the brightest folks on campus, right? All due respect, like on <laughs> average, you know, you, you hit your head a number of times. You, medicine isn't really the careers you start pursuing, you know, like <laughs> granted, one of my teammates is, you know, an MS2 at a Canadian med school. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to come across as saying like all football players are stupid. That's not at all what I'm saying, but as a former football player, you know, it's a different cohort. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I think, you know, to your point, like it, it is kind of an unfortunate nature of, you know, the MCAT exam. It's just one of these things where like you have to do better than somebody else. And usually the breaking point, and tell me if you disagree, Ahmed, I do feel strongly that while total amount of hours put into this test will increase your trajectory you know as you go along individually yeah i do feel like there are those who utilize their time preparing for this test so much more efficiently 
Oh, big time. So it, big time. And I and I think this is a huge topic that we're discussing today with, you know, question bank practice questions. I've just seen a host of different ways of approaching practice questions, yeah. question banks. And some are very, very good at extracting as much as they possibly can mm-hmm. from every single question. And other folks really could spend five hours doing questions and gain almost nothing. Yeah. And that's what we don't want from all you <laughs> listeners out there, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, Ahmed, we talked about starting early. We know mm-hmm. that's a huge takeaway for our listeners. Don't yeah. wait till you're a pro or a, you know what, what you think is a pro or completely proficient in all the MCAT topics before you start busting open practice questions. But what have you seen to be helpful for your students when they are, let's say, using two to three hours in a given day doing practice questions? What are like the high yield takeaways for you? I mean, I think the first thing is just from a mindset standpoint. I think Mm -hmm. people have this, and it's natural. Like if I pay for a question bank, whether that's the AAMC or something else, I feel the need to get every ounce of value out of my financial investment, which means doing as many practice questions as humanly possible, which is not inherently a bad thing, but it right. sometimes it comes at the expense, pun intended, of you know the quality or benefit of the questions. Mm-hmm. And so the first thing I always tell students, and it sounds simple, but don't make the same mistake twice. Yes, yes. You do that. I promise you, there is a finite number of mistakes you can make on the MCAT. Guaranteed. Like, it's not this endless abyss that you never reach the end of. Like, if you do enough practice questions, you will make, like, say you get everything wrong in practice, but you never make the same mistake twice, you could go out and get a 520. Like, I'm convinced. Because, like I said, like, there's a limited not a small, like I want to make that very clear. There's lots of mistakes that you can Mm -hmm. make, but it's finite. There's a list and that list has an end. And if you commit to not making the same mistake twice, you take your rate of improvement from doing this and it starts doing that, right? Like, especially in the sciences, like the sciences, there's a, you know, there's a two headed approach to improving. There's the strategy side, there's the content side, whereas cars is obviously just strategy. So that's the first thing, like from a mentality standpoint, like it's not about volume, at least not always. Yeah. Just don't make the same mistake twice. It's, I don't want to say it's that simple, but it really is that simple. Yeah. Right? Like for me, like, and I, I learned that lesson playing football to be completely honest, because, you know, my first, my freshman year in practice, I threw more interceptions than I care to admit, but you know, what I didn't realize as a freshman was like, there's only so many looks a defense can give me, right? There's, there's a limited number of players on the field. Not all of them are going to stand in a circle, right? Like they're going to occupy space a certain distance from one another. There's mm-hmm. only so many things they can do. Right. And like that epiphany of like, Oh, there's an end to the number of options that I can see was like, Oh, okay, cool. That's this. Yes. And you, you know, you start learning like, okay, you know, I made that mistake because I thought this when it was really that. Now I know, given this same scenario, this is what I can expect. And the key is now like taking the time to A, reach that conclusion, and then B, revisiting it periodically. So you're like, yeah, no, I remember why I got that wrong. And then you don't yeah. make that mistake again. And if if you take anything from this, I would say that's it. Just don't make the mistake twice. And I think that, so I could not agree with that more. And I think that's really in my mind, if there was one thing that differentiates people when it comes to good sound question bank practice or practice tests, it's those who do well are super thoughtful about the mistakes they're making yeah. and they make plans to avoid 
creating those mistakes. Because to your point, Ahmed, we can't we can't just say, oh, I'm never going to do this again and then gloss forward two seconds looking at the question and, and right. just move on. Okay, question 37. There's no way all you did is essentially tell yourself you're not going to make that mistake. So the question for all of us out here is like, what is it that I can do to not be that student? And a couple of things I want to point out. I am a firm believer in having it written down somewhere, whether yeah. you have a notepad, if that's what works for you, or you list out your mistakes and you write something down that will help you. Mm -hmm. For me, it was Anki. I made every single mistake on an MCAT question into yeah. an Anki card that would brutally remind me of that mistake I once made. Were you putting the screenshots in there too? Right. I, I did screenshots. I did yeah. I did everything I could to remind myself of the mistake I made. And, and I kid you not, this is a practice I still hold today. If you were on my phone in my notes tab, you'd find a tab that's that's called dumb intern mistakes <laughs> I made. And, and it to, turned, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say to clarify for our viewers. Like, this isn't in a self-deprecating manner. This isn't, oh, Jaden, you idiot. Like, you're so, yeah. that, like, that's not what Jaden's exactly. getting at. It's just to revisit the thought process and the growth, right? Yes. Like, in the moment, you're like, oh, okay, this is wrong because of this. And then now when you revisit it, it's, do I remember what I should have done? It's not to remind you, like, you know, you goof, you, you made a mistake. It's more so, hey, like you learned from this way back yeah. when. Do you still remember that? So exactly. I just wanted to make that crystal clear. Like Jane's not beating himself up. He's reminding himself of his growth is the way I would look at it. And I think it does need a little bit of balance. I think this is always like you played football. I played football. I think the rule of a coach is not always to be your friend. And in the MCAT, you don't always have a coach with you. It's nice if you have like, one-on-one -on -one mentoring we've advocated for that on this this show multiple times yeah but sometimes you need to be your own coach like when i would see yeah. students and i'd walk them through a practice exam and they made silly silly mistakes i wanted to them i wanted for them to get to a point that they weren't hard on themselves I, that's not what i'm looking for to your point i don't want people yeah. to be hard on themselves but you should feel a little bit of a sting of like these were points that I gave away. Right. And you should, you know, that could make the difference between a scholarship and not. And if that's the little fire under your bum that gets you to move. Yeah. So be it. You got to find that inner drive. And I, I, I can't prescribe it for everybody. But right. I do find that students who do not kind of almost take it personally when they miss something they should have gotten. Right. You know, I start to worry about their performance because you should be bummed that you missed the same topic three times in a test, even yeah. though you studied it the night before. What is it right. that we can do to prevent that from happening again? You know? Right. And so it needs to be a fine balance of not self-deprecating, but also like it should sit with you. Like the mistakes that I've made as an intern when I was an intern are 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 things that I won't forget because they have a little bit of sting to them. Right. 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 I hope you know, there's nothing so egregious in the MCAT that it should really weigh on your soul. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in medicine, too, you know, you're going to have times where as a medical student, you know, you a common one I see in surgery all the time is brand new medical students walk into the operating room and contaminate the surgical field. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it's one of the most humiliating experiences for a young medical student because somebody yeah. else somebody inevitably will yell at you um probably a surgeon probably a scrub tech probably a resident and you feel terrible but it's something that you take away from that and you find like you don't make that same mistake again yeah you, and so there there needs to be a balance and i and i i don't want students to feel that they need to just beat themselves up but maybe just a little bit to learn from it enough you know we, yeah. we remember our mistakes more than our successes yeah, and I think that helps us out, and that's why we advocate for early practice, right? Yeah, more mistakes early on are going to lead to more memories being formed and stronger connections. That it's going to help us do well on the test. I don't know how my way. and I, I mean, I guess I, I I took my analogy pill this morning because they just keep 
kind of roll it off. But to your <laughs> point about there needs to be a sting, um, you know, I remember way back when I came across a YouTube video uh, and basically the moral of the, mu- the, the moral of the YouTube video is like advocating for fewer warnings and more citations among police officers. Mm. And the, the thought was a warning doesn't change behavior. A citation mm-hmm. does. Right. And it's kind of in line with your point yeah. there where like, it yeah. can't just be a, Oh, oops. You know, oops. Exactly. <laughs> but it's gotta be like, there's gotta like, I want to be very careful in phrasing this. Like, you don't like you don't need to just like humiliate yourself. Like that's not yeah. what we're saying. But like, you know, you need to acknowledge like, okay, I put in some work. That work wasn't good enough to answer this question. Whether that was a focus issue or a focus lapse, uh, just a content gap, something I missed, mm-hmm. didn't understand, like something along the way of me getting here caused me to get this wrong. And so I think the way I would frame it from a, you know, constructive standpoint is like, use it as like a little chip on your shoulder. Like, yeah. Oh, you know, I got that wrong. All right, cool. Watch, watch what happens the next time I get that question. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the healthiest way to view it. Right. Cause like, I think you, you find yourself on a slippery slope when you say like, it's got to stink. Right. Cause some people will hear that and know exactly what we're talking about. Others inevitably will take it too far. And that's like, we want to avoid that. Like that's right. worse than no sting at all, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. But I think that, like I said, the healthiest way to view that question bank mistake is like, oh, you know, I got that wrong. Cool. Watch this. Right. Like, you know, I always looked at it as like the MCAT was just saying, hey, like, nice try. You know, yeah. <laughs> like the MCAT was taunting me all. I'm like, oh yeah, all right, cool. Check this out. Right. And, and I guess like that's just always how I've been wired. Like, I was always a super competitive kid. Like, it's a, it could have been the most random thing. It could have been you know blindfold hula hooping in third grade gym class. True story. Um, and uh, I was like the last pick, and like my teams, whatever. Like I, I think they had like team captains and I was like the last pick for this like blindfold hula hoop relay race. And, you know, to, to quote Michael Jordan, not a, not equating myself to Michael Jordan, but to quote Michael Jordan, <laughs> took that personally, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, I was, I was the exact same way with the MCAT. Like anytime I got a question wrong, like I knew I was dumb. Like that wasn't the thought. It was just like, like, I know I can get that right. And it's honestly the times where I didn't think I could get it right. That motivated me the most. It was like, yeah. okay, like I'm not just gonna sit here and accept that I have no clue what's going on. Like I'm gonna figure this out. Like, and I think maybe pride is another thing that can be a powerful motivator. Is like everyone that's taking this exam is ambitious and intelligent, right? Obviously, like they're like we're all intelligent in different areas, right? Like. Some people are really just artistically gifted. Some people are very, you know, athletically gifted. Like, you know, but in any case, if you're here and you're listening to this, you have strengths, right? Mm-hmm. And so you wouldn't be taking this exam if it wasn't even remotely possible for you to do well, right? And so leverage that. Like, say to yourself, okay, like, I'm good enough to answer this question. Like, I'm not just going to sit here and accept that I don't know an answer. Right? I'm going to figure this out. And the last thing I'll add to that point is like, know that many people before you have figured that out, Mm -hmm. right? And many people have, like you, doubted whether they would figure it out, right? Like, I I genuinely, when I was studying, I never thought I would figure out fluid dynamics. And truth be told, I don't think I actually really figured it out until I started teaching the MCAT. (laughs) But I knew it, I knew it well enough. Like I couldn't teach it to anybody else, but like I could recognize what equations I needed to use at different points in time. And it was one of the AMC practice exams actually that made me realize, okay, I don't know fluid dynamics, like even remotely close to the level I thought I did. Mm -hmm. We're going to fix that. Right. And I think having that pride in, in that context was what got me to say, okay, Hey, let's figure this out. As opposed to saying, well, I hope that doesn't come up on the exam, you know, like, yeah, 
And I think there is a little bit of that among students. I agree. And I love the phrase, like, I knew it well enough. I think that highlights another principle of question banks and practice and just doing well on this test. It's that most of the questions you're going to get wrong on a question bank or practice exam, you did know the 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 topic or the the background information yeah well enough to get the answer um and it, whether it comes to strategy we've talked about how to kind of break down question stems we yeah. talked about how to stay mentally locked for such a long period of time building up stamina etc these are all tools for our students to get questions right, even if it doesn't feel like they know 100% of that content tie-in, you know? Right. And I think day one of me studying for the MCAT, I was missing a lot of questions that I had enough background to answer. I just needed to spend more time in the question bank understanding where the thinking went awry, right? whether it's a strategy component or whether my, you know, kind of content map in my head of how all these principles tying together were a little askew. I think it's important for students to realize that they don't need to use the scapegoat of like, I just didn't know fluid dynamics well enough, but yeah. really assume you probably did. There's something we can draw from this. That's not particularly just content. Um, cause there are, there are questions you can get correct on the test, not having known a single stitch of the content and you can still yeah. get sure, right. Yeah. I would look for those pearls just if, just as much, if not more than like your content failures, but that's where students love to like perseverate on is like, okay, I'm going to review my questions that I took today mm -hmm. and I'm going to focus on like where my content was off, where I didn't know fluid dynamics of how I didn't know about a titration. When really, if you want to get the most points, the biggest bang for your buck, you focus on the strategy principles behind the question. Yeah. How your thought process, your timing, all of these things we've talked about previously, that's what I would focus on when you're reviewing, you know, question banks, not just content failures. It's, it's important, right? If there's some big principle you like i don't even know what pasui's law is and it showed up like yeah you should look up pasui's law but you should also ask yourself like was there a way to know this without actually knowing about pasui's yeah. law yeah and if you have that type of investigatory mindset this kind of like um probing mindset of like could i actually yeah. have gotten away with this without knowing you are going to fare well on this test no yeah. doubt. Do you agree, Amen? Hundred percent. Like I think, you know, there are a lot of questions that you can. You know, we talked at length on a previous episode about process of elimination. Like it, it's so true. Like there's, if I had a guess, and this is purely a guess, but I would say at least a third of questions in any given. And we'll say any given science section, because obviously you, you kind of have to understand the car's passage to understand the questions, but at least a third of the questions in the sciences, you can get down to two answer choices, comfort, comfortably, and, you know, could even be higher than a third. But I think, you know, to your point, Jaden, you know, in, in my tutoring experience, I think people tend to focus more on like, I got this wrong because I didn't know. And I think subconsciously maybe that's more comforting like oh i only got this wrong just because i didn't know it but if i knew right. that i would have been fine exactly you know, it, it's it's hard to i think when, when people look for strategy errors i think subconsciously that makes us think okay i'm a bad test taker and i think it's more insulting than oh i just didn't know that you know <laughs> it's not my fault i got that wrong i just haven't exactly. seen it yet and i think I, I, you know, full transparency, like that was me. Like I, you know, I, I was always, you know, the scapegoat student. I was always like, oh yeah, I just didn't know that. I need to know that next time. And then I'm good. 
right? But like to my point about not making the same mistake twice, by having such a narrow-minded view, I might have missed the fact that, dude, like two of the answer choices were saying the exact same thing. Like, yeah, you didn't know the content, but A and C are identical and B doesn't even make any sense, right? So me choosing A, you're like, yeah, I could have known the content and chosen B as the correct answer, but like I also could have just like put two and two together and said, okay, well, A and C are out. D is better than B, so D is my answer. Right. And so if I have that narrow minded view, I'll learn the content lesson, but I'm going to neglect the strategy lesson and I'm going to make that mistake again. Right. And so if we're as committed as we say we are to not making the same mistake twice, you have to look at both sides. Mm -hmm. Right. Because fixing a content mistake, like, won't really ever fix a strategy mistake, but the converse is, you know, completely different. Like a strategy, like fixing a strategy mistake can compensate for numerous content gaps, right? Like strategy applies to all 230 questions. Yep. Right. Any bit of content will at most apply to 10 questions. Like, and that's like at most, at yep. very most. Like take Huge amino acids. You will not get more than 10 amino acids questions. I guarantee it. Like at most you will have 10. You could have one. I mean, yeah, I was one that I was expecting so many. And I saw so many people like writing out, you know, in that time period where yeah. you get to, I'm not saying it's a wrong thing to do. It wasn't my choice or style, but I right. see people trying to write out all the amino acids. And if they got the same test that I got that day, which I imagine we probably had the same form. Damn, yeah. that sucks because they just spent <laughs> their entire time and we got one question. Yeah. You know, you just can't predict these things. And like you said, Ahmed, 230 questions, you know, you can benefit from improving your strategy. Yeah. So. And I think, you know, that's where I would wrap up is like, if you take like the, the you know, the TLDR version of this episode is, you know, start early, right? gradually tilt the scale from discrete to passage by incorporating like specifically chosen passages we'll say and you can you mm -hmm. know get that from you know a, a friend or a tutor or a mentor like somebody who knows this exam and can guide you in the direction of good resources right you talked about not making the same mistake twice i think is a very very critical mindset to adopt Right. And then in that review process, looking at both the content and the strategy. And to your point, Jaden, you know, not just using content gaps as a scapegoat, right? Having that probing mentality of, all right, but like, what else could I have done? Like, where could I have done myself a favor? Yeah. No, I think that's a great summary. And there's one last thing I'd leave everybody with. Students would ask me all the time, like, how long should I be spending inside my question banks, like reviewing things? And I, I stuck with this rule of thumb. It really has helped me out and it's helped a lot of other students. It's not perfect, but I would say, you know, if you're going to spend an hour taking practice questions, it probably should take you almost two to review those questions. Like a one to two ratio, I think is something to at least start out with if you're kind of uncertain about how do you yeah. go about this or you've never really. And I think it's the principle of like, this takes work. You can't just answer questions and expect Take to get time. stuff out of it. If you want to make sure you don't make mistakes twice, you better learn about your mistake, not yeah. just the fact that you made one. And right. that's the difference that I see with students who spend a lot of time trying to understand what went wrong versus just understanding that something went wrong. And, and I think if you do that, if you are spending just as much, if not more time thinking about what went awry and what you can improve on, how to not make that mistake again, you're going to see so many more early jumps in your scores and throughout the process than if you just take two seconds to say, oops, I got C wrong next, you know, right. That, and that's how a lot of people tend to do it. So just be mindful of that. And I think that principle, the one to two or two to one, whatever way you want to look at it, kind of incorporates a lot of what we've discussed today. It's really this metacognition of being aware, like I've got to take time to put into this um, and to make sure I don't make these mistakes again.
probably over time that two to one ratio comes down a little bit. Like as you get more yeah. and more experience with mm-hmm. this exam, like I think towards the later stages of your prep, you might even hit a one to one. But yeah, especially early on, like take the time to go through the details and just soak it in, right? Yeah. I think it's definitely important. And so the way we talked about that seesaw tilting from in favor of discrete questions to in favor of passage questions, you know, that seesaw of, you know, study to review ratio sort of tilts from two to one, maybe closer to one to one, you know, yeah. as you reach the end of your prep. But everybody's different too. Like some people will take a little bit longer. Some people yep. take a little bit shorter. Just and it's an efficiency thing. Um, and so, you know, to wrap up, I would say you know find a process that's efficient, right? Whether that's Anki, whether that's writing things down, like you mentioned earlier, Jane. Whether that's you know voice notes. I've seen some people like recording little voice memos for themselves, and they listen to that as they, um, you know, commute or you know, walk, et cetera, and they can visualize, oh, yeah, I remember that question, you know, just finding what works for you, I think is important, you know, not just in the MCAT, but studying in general and, you know, as future physicians, clinicians, et cetera. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got for us, Jane. Anything you want to add? That's it, man. Awesome. Well, I appreciate all of our listeners and viewers tuning in to yet another episode of Jack West and MCAT Podcast. We look forward to seeing you guys on next week's episodes. Happy studying. Take care, guys.